Prepare to hack and slash your way through a Japanese road trip with a slightly off-season Halloween theme, as today we ask ourselves, can you be Persona 5 Strikers with only a jack-o'-lantern? As always, we're playing solo on the hardest difficulty setting, and we're banning the use of all DLC, as well as all glitches, hacks, mods, etc. Let's do it. After spamming basic melee attacks to get through the mandatory tutorial, which is impossible to fail because you literally can't die, we get confetti fired at our head and look incredibly happy to see our friends again. Uh, okay. We name ourselves Pump King. Look, I was struggling for a funny name this time around, alright. <laughs> And after grabbing some SP restoring drinks from the good old bathhouse vending machine, we see the world's most powerful hairspray and head on into the metaverse for the first dungeon or jail of the game. Within minutes we've met up with Sophie and are pushing through the sewers. The game won't let us remove party members yet but as soon as it does, Joker will be doing this entire run by himself. Until then we just pretend that they're not even participating. During the subsequent Bicorn boss fight, jack o lanterns mask finally drops. Welcome to the team, friend. While the fight plays out, let's talk a bit about the persona that's hopefully going to carry us to victory. jack o lantern is a weak level 2 persona with terrible stats, 2 weaknesses, a pathetic move pool and is one of the worst personas in the entire game. It's only saving grace is its ability to absorb fire damage, which might be helpful in super niche situations, but there are very few fire users in this game, so it's not really much of an advantage. <laughs> With the beast defeated, we do some investigating, stock up on items, and get asked by Makoto if we'd like to go and see Dragon Like Yakuza. Wait, I just realised we haven't done a challenge run of that game yet, even though it's bloody brilliant. <laughs> Well, that's getting added to the list. Unlike previous Persona games, this one lets you use Persona Points, or PP, to level up or later buff the stats of any Persona you own. And PP is relatively easy to come by. Just farm mobs, fuse Personas, or my personal favourite, repeatedly purchase old Personas from the registry and instantly delete them from existence. <laughs> In terms of bond skills, we obviously go with bond maker so that we'll gain more bond XP for the rest of the game. That just leaves the purchase of weaponry from some dodgy website and we're all set up to properly infiltrate the first jail. Knocking enemies down with ambushes grants us a one more, a powerful spinning strike that deals massive damage. But while the enemy jack-o'-lanterns aren't too tough, we need to watch out for enemies like this bicorn who can charge in to deal huge amounts of physical damage. And don't worry, that will become a big problem for us a bit later on. Um, um, uh, are you okay there, buddy? <laughs> Bruh. Taking on three bicorns at once would be near impossible if not for our ultimate ability, Showtime. Now that's what I call massive damage. Just a shame it takes freaking forever to charge up. <laughs> we do hit a few... Um, bumps along the way, but eventually arrive at Alice's castle. We're forced into an encounter with the beguiling girl mini-boss who has powerful electric attacks, spawns in additional waves of enemies, and can even heal herself. We're forced to stay on the offensive, which mainly consists of melee strikes since she's not weak to fire. As the fight drags on, we try to exploit her weakness to gunfire a bit more in order to set up one more's, and it soon pays off. She's down in just under three minutes. But now, it's time to introduce you to one of the hardest and most frustrating fights of the entire game. Check this out, just a random trash mob that we have to get past, right? Just two bicorns and three silkies, no big deal, right? Wrong. We only have one SP and these silkies can exploit our weakness to ice while the bicorns pummel us into submission in this incredibly tiny arena which has no environmental objects that we can interact with. In the 35 minutes that I attempted this fight on repeat, the best I could do was cower behind this parked vehicle to hide from the Bufu artillery while baiting out one bicorn at a time to help thin out the mob. Finally, they were down. Job done. Whew. I don't think I've ever run that fast to a save point in my life. <laughs> it's 
Soon after, we unlock Joker's final master art, Deadshot, which allows us to use up to six bullets to charge up our gun for massive damage. And yep, ammo fully replenishes between fights. Nice. The troublesome housemaid miniboss is weak to fire and therefore a complete joke, so I'll save your time. The end of the next sewer section had another tricky mob though, in the form of dozens if not hundreds of enemies, so myriad that even the minimap can't keep up. <laughs> we died more than a few times here until we eventually developed the strategy of trying to leave the enemy jack-o'-lanterns alive as much as possible, since their aggy fire blasts slightly heal us and therefore help us drag out the fight that little bit longer. Job done. After grabbing a powerful Blitz Dagger, which has the ability to occasionally freeze enemies, we finally arrive at the first of Alice's three towers. No mini boss here, just another egregiously large mob led by ice slinging silkies. Within seconds, we get animation locked and easily KO'd by a point blank boofoo. The second attempt, however, goes much better. You can see our strategy by keeping a keen eye on the minimap. We're trying to use the tower's geography to put some distance between ourselves and the bulk of the mob, allowing us to cherry pick the stragglers just a few at a time. Four minutes later, they're all down and we grab Alice's first of three shiny power source core desire thingies, the pop dress. Nice. After some Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 6, we come across this treasure chest behind a set of lasers. I know a lot of people get stuck figuring this one out, myself included, back when I first played the game, so here's the solution for anyone who's interested. There's a random button slash switch thingy around the corner that grants you just 8 seconds to reach the chest, so using the skateboard is your best bet. It can take a few tries, but the alluring sticker accessory inside is amazing, boosting your showtime charge rate, which is something that no other accessory will be able to do for quite a while. We'll be keeping that one equipped for a long time. We make sure our showtime gauge is indeed full for Futaba's first hacking section, where you have to protect her from waves of enemies while she gets the door open. I've seen people say they hate these sections because they're kind of like escort missions, but honestly, I think they're great fun. Well, <laughs> most of them anyway. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your hack is now complete. Been a Guarding Tower number two is the Heavenly Punisher mini boss. Wait, I'm getting a real sense of deja vu here. We're only hitting for around 20 odd damage, whereas even when we're guarding, he's hitting for over 90! It's just a test of endurance, but after 6 minutes we get greedy and go for a lunge and get punished for it. Now that's what I call MASSIVE DAMAGE! But this version of him is an absolute tank, with sky high defences and an enormous health pool. Yeah, this is gonna go on a while. Showtimes do a decent amount of damage, but of course they're slow to charge, so we only get a few of those off in the entire fight. After almost half an hour, our gunfire finishes the thing off and we grab the second core. Nice. We get Jack to level 6 where he learns his final move, the passive skill Soul Thief, for a tiny bit of occasional SP restoration. <laughs> Damn, we really need some skill cards badly. Serious? After that, the rest of this dungeon wasn't too bad. Of course, we wouldn't dare to touch the optional Dire Shadow Super Boss with a barge pole. Eh. Uh, oh, sod it. Let's give it a go. The fight begins, and, uh, wait, is his health bar even moving? <laughs> oh, okay, right, yeah, we deserve that. <laughs> After taking down the menacing Owl Man mini boss, who offered a slight challenge but nothing we couldn't handle, we're forced into a fight against the Night Walking Warrior. Like the Heavenly Punisher mini boss earlier, this guy is very tanky, but thankfully these crackers can be launched to exploit his wind weakness. From there, it's just a matter of keeping our distance while spamming the secondary attack button until it inevitably falls. That's all three cores in the bag, so we're ready to secure the infiltration route. But before that, yep, we buy out half of all the stock in Shibuya Central Street and endlessly farm enemies for XP. Wait, what the... <laughs> what in the actual f... Subscribe or I will haunt your dreams. <laughs>
The Succubus mini-boss is weak to gunfire and therefore incredibly easy, but we're not going to push on any further yet because the second we enter the castle is the point of no return and we're bound to get minced. So there's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. Enemies here give pitiful XP, but it's mainly the mask drops that we want so we can convert the PP into level ups for Jack. There's also a great chest you can farm right here in Miyame Park. On one occasion we got a Tarakaja skill card which allows us to boost our attack power for a moderate duration. Nice! Oracle soon learns the overpowered moral support ability, allowing her to occasionally replenish our HP and SP in battle, as well as bestowing us with various buffs. Bruh, it's technically not a solo run if Futaba is helping you dislike and subscribe. Well, we've talked about this issue in previous Persona runs, full playlist linked at the end, but since Futaba is a non-combat support only character who you cannot remove from the party, pretty much everyone in the comments agreed that it's fair game. Besides, she's much less helpful here than in Royal. Anyway, we're in the castle now, and after running down the clock on this lift slash elevator, we go against... Oh, for God's sake, man! Two thousand years later. The infiltration route has now been secured, but this game has one extra step before we can send that calling card, defeating the ruler's lock keeper. Despite being weak to fire, this fight took 26 minutes, mainly due to these annoying pixie enemies that just love to heal the boss, meaning we have to prioritise killing them before anything else. Oh, and did I mention that they respawn infinitely? <laughs> Yeah, just just look at them flapping away. Git. But yeah, after burning through almost all of our items, it goes down to a few regular slashes. Job done. We spend almost an entire day farming for a specific skill card. Null Brainwash. And we're at a whopping level 17 with jack o at level 12. And now, I'm gonna make you mine. Oh my! Um, no thanks. <laughs> Alice Hiragi is the game's first big main story boss. She's weak to both fire and wind, which is great, especially due to the arena being conveniently littered with more of those single-use party crackers. She has a ton of health though, and her physical strikes are insanely strong, so we have to keep our distance as we chip her health down with gunshots. She moves quite slowly during phase 1, so that 10 minute block was pretty simple, but then this happens. Wait for it. Wait for it. Yep, down from almost full HP in a fraction of a split second. Yikes! Second attempt and phase 1 was pretty much the same as before, so we'll fast forward a bit. Throughout phase 2, it was essential that we keep an eye what skills she's using and always respond accordingly. Or else, yeah, we don't want to repeat of that last attempt. <laughs> Slice and Dice is the one to watch out for. The trick is to move away from her when she's at the edge of the arena, but then sprint laterally as she approaches, i.e. moving perpendicular to her direction of movement. Ho <laughs> ho, camera angle. Another strong skill is How Dare You, which is a series of seven powerful slashes, followed by a fair bit of downtime. Thankfully, after only 20-something minutes, the show's over. Job done. That's 1000 XP in the bag. With Alice down, our campervan road trip can finally begin. Alright, let's go. First destination, Sendai, home to tons of awesome new shops, beautiful scenery and of course the second jail, this time owned by author Ango Natsume. These Bereth enemies replace Bicorns as the new tanky nuisance, whereas the Dorma mini-boss that repeatedly crops up almost exclusively spams fire magic and is therefore a complete joke. <laughs> See, even Futaba agrees. 
After discovering our inability to walk around a searchlight, we keep stocking up on cooking supplies, complete Futaba's first hack, which was surprisingly difficult and we did fail a fair few times, meet the world's most excitable tent enthusiast, grab some incense to boost Jack's stats, have fun mocking the shockingly bad draw distances in this game, I mean, I mean look at this, Jesus Christ, and continue farming enemies. Well, getting battered around by them anyway. <laughs> we grab Angle's core and... Wait, look, I love this game to death, but can we just spend a second to talk about how shocking the aliasing is in this game? Yeah, the jagged edges on all of the characters. What the hell happened? Vanilla P5 and Royal were both smooth as butter. Oh! Before pushing into Angle's castle, we desperately need a wider move pool. Thankfully, there's a solution. By keeping Shibuya Jail's security level high and running around while continuing to fight mobs, we can occasionally find these super rare treasure demon enemies. The ones in this jail are weak to fire and drop random elemental skill cards like Aha for curse damage, Freya for nuclear damage, you name it. It's enough to help us push past the tedious war hungry horseman mini boss and onto the lock keeper. This thing is weak to curse, so it should be easy, right? Right? Well... <laughs> okay, that didn't quite go to plan. <laughs> Thankfully, the second attempt went much smoother as we learned his moveset and practiced some social distancing. Sorry for the speed of the footage here, but this fight went on for over half an hour and again completely drained all of our items. But eventually, it goes down. Time for the game's second big main story boss, Shadow Natsume in the form of the Nightmare Dragon Ango. This thing's only weaknesses are Ice, which we don't have, and Bless, which we also don't have. <laughs> uh, uh. Look, I didn't want to spend another 5 hours farming treasure demons for that slight chance of getting Bufu or Koha. Although, spoiler alert, we kind of get forced to do that later in the run. So I just thought we'd rely on these sword monuments that can be infinitely used to fire off shards of blessed damage to chip away at his huge health pool and shields. Ango is insanely tanky, but one saving grace is that he occasionally throws out fireballs, which of course jack o lantern can drain to heal us. Nice! This means we have to keep chipping away until this thing's armour falls off later in the fight and he therefore becomes extremely vulnerable. The strategy as always is to stay mobile and never get greedy. After half an hour he finally falls to a sword throw. Job done. Defeat the great overlord! Defeated! Alright, with Sendai done, our road trip pushes onto the northern city of Sapporo. And again, this place is gorgeous. Well, except for all the trash left down here, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll just ignore that for now. The jail here is Japan's version of Disney's Frozen, and a lot of the enemies are weak to fire, which is really helpful. After noticing a blatant typo, we play a bit of SSX. grab the cores and nip back to Shibuya for more elemental type coverage. I love how these treasure demons can also drop permanent stat boosting incenses too, it makes farming them even more useful and interesting, but strap in people because it's time for a boss rush. First up is this terrifying duo blocking access to the third jail's castle. With Divine Governor here being weak to Curse and his partner Wishless Star being weak to Nuke, it seems like this should be a really easy fight. We just have to... Wait, what? We were at full health! After a few more attempts, we finally have this run. We immediately go aggressive on the Governor since it has the ability to heal both enemies, which is definitely not okay. He's down in just a few minutes and our attention swaps over to the Star, who is already almost half dead from collateral splash damage. <laughs> and again, like with many bosses in this game, we can stun lock him by exploiting his weakness. Yeah, prepare yourself because that's going to be a recurring theme going forward. Next up is the Lock Keeper, whose shields are purely cosmetic and we can therefore just stun lock it with curse spells and one mores. Nice and easy. 
but after gifting Haru her long-awaited screen time, we push on to the third big boss, Mariko Hyodo, mayor of Sapporo, who, uh, looks a lot different to the real-life version of the mayor of Sapporo. <laughs> Here's our setup going in. Joker and jack o are both level 38, but our moveset is still pretty weak. Let's go. Attempt number one, and we're repeatedly exploiting her curse weakness before she grabs her cutlery and decides to tuck in for massive damage. A one-shot kill combo. Ouch. Attempt number two. Okay, we've made it a bit further and things are looking good until she just burps on us and it's GG. Attempt number three, and she's cooled the room to severely slows down. It's fine though, we just gotta turn on the... Okay, wrong heater. Just gotta get to the... Ah, that's better. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, well, that happened. <laughs> Many attempts later, and this was the furthest we got. We're chilled and she's launching a volley of ice, so needless to say, we get absolutely obliterated. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. We've raised our standards of treasure demon hunting now because we're farming them in Sendai. These ones drop incenses much more frequently and even occasionally drop medium power skill cards like this Garula and this Agilao. Nice. At level 40, we're back with Mariko. Okay, let's kick things off with some curse damage and... Oh, well, that happened. <laughs> After what seemed like a thousand failed attempts, we finally had this run. We kick things off with a Tarakaja to boost our attack, then try to angle our Eha curse uses so that the one moors push her towards the chandeliers, which can be dropped for huge chunks of physical damage, especially to her shields. Shame there's only four of them though. I was actually very surprised at how difficult this boss was. I remember when I first played the game casually back in 2021, I thought Mariko was by far the easiest boss in the entire game. I think that's because she's extremely punishing to solo runs, mainly due to her dinner time ability being able to one shot gobble you up if you even get remotely close to her. If you've played Strikers before, let me know what boss you found most difficult in the comments down there. In fact, what was your favourite boss? For me, I think it's probably too close to call. They're all pretty good. Anyway, after 9 minutes, Mariko is down, and as always, if you'd like to watch the full regular speed unedited boss fight footage, then it'll be uploaded onto Patreon. Thank you to all these fantastic people who are already supporting these challenge runs. Really appreciate all of you. After Futaba does her best impression of Celine Dion... We begin investigating the beautiful island of Okinawa. Our trip here will be a short one though because this part of the game has a jail with no ruler so it's kind of like half a palace really, but still we smash on through. This place gives me Persona 4 bunker vibes, you know, Naoto's dungeon, mm, anyone else? <laughs> We've got access to some great recipes now, which are our new primary method of obtaining SP restoring items. We also obtain the skill card resist ice, which will patch up one of Jack's weaknesses, nice, if I remember to equip it, which I didn't, because I forgot, for the rest of the entire run. <laughs> oh well. Time for Okinawa's first mini boss, the 100 armed watcher. This beefy boy is only weak to bless and can dish out some serious pain. Thankfully, despite its appearance, it doesn't have much health and therefore goes down in just two and a half minutes. Job done. After a short hacking section with Futaba, which honestly wasn't too bad and probably the easiest one so far, we're at level 42 and push onto the final boss of the dungeon, another lock keeper, but yep, we got wiped out quite a few times. <laughs> We come back a level higher with a bulkier supply of items, but will it be enough? The fight begins and we continue to stun lock the thing by hitting its weakness. The drawback here is that as soon as we run out of SP and items that restore SP, we are dead. Our SP reserves finally hit rock bottom, but the thing is on a sliver of health. Come on. Yes, let's go. That's 6,000 XP in the bag. 
We're leaving Okinawa just as quickly as we arrived, which is kind of a shame because I feel like this area had so much more potential. But after skipping through some spoilery spoilery cutscenes, we're thrown straight into the next jail, Kyoto. Full disclaimer, there is a compulsory section here where you're forced to play as Police Inspector Zenkichi Hasegawa, aka Wolf, but I'm not classing it as a run fail because it's a mandatory, unskippable story section. We just make sure to never use his persona Valjean and instead just keep swinging until the story continues. After grabbing some more bond abilities, we head into the Kyoto Jail properly this time. I absolutely love the traditional Japanese aesthetic to this dungeon and the background music just makes it even better. If I had to be critical though, I'd say it would be nice to see this place in daytime rather than just nighttime. But hey, I'm planning to visit Japan IRL next year for the first time ever, so maybe I'll just have to see the real Kyoto temples for myself. <laughs> For completion's sake, the Ancient Lord fight was super easy thanks to our relatively new Garula skill, and we've now gained the ability to pay to boost jack o lantern specific stats. So, of course, we primarily spec into magic. Gotta get that massive damage somehow, eh? <laughs> Within minutes, it's already time for the big Kyoto boss. Yeah, sadly, this was another mini jail. <laughs> Joker and Jack are both level 45, and we're up against... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I can't. It's that hairdo, it's just like... <laughs> anyway, the first half of the fight played out pretty normally, though I was recording this footage first thing on a Saturday morning, and I remember being half asleep, so if my gameplay looks terrible, well, yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> but after a while, this happens. Yeah, enemy Joker just sits there while we introduce him to a jolly good helping of conflagration. <laughs> that was an incredibly easy fight, but a nice change of pace. Kyoto, done. On to Osaka, and it's time for another shopping spree. The jail here, unlike the previous two, is full-sized with an actual ruler this time. In fact, it's probably the largest jail in the entire game. The first mini-boss is the Auspicious Pachyderm, and if you understand what either of those words mean, then well done because your IQ is probably in the top percentile. It's weak to curse, but even with our attack boosted from Tarakaja, the enemy just isn't going down easily. It takes a whopping 5 minutes to take down, which, come to think of it, sounds like a lot, but thinking back... After almost half an hour, our gunfire finishes the thing off and we grab the second core. Okay, maybe five minutes isn't too bad. <laughs> Futaba's hacking section is easy enough to clear with the excessive consumption of items, but that's when we hit another roadblock. The strumming Beaner player. Oh my god. This thing is surrounded by huge mobs, can heal itself and can deal Massive damage! Yeah, the thing literally one-shot us. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. The fact that the game lets you have rematches with previous big baddies is awesome in my opinion, and something that I hope they continue with in the Persona series going forward. We're back at level 49, but yep, <laughs> still not happening. We spend almost an entire day farming treasure demons in Kyoto before coming back at a staggering level 55, but will it be enough? Honestly, it's difficult to know who or what to target in this absolute cluster beep of enemies. Showtimes are absolutely the saving graces here, and in fact that's exactly what it takes to wipe the thing out. Without a doubt, that was one of the toughest bosses so far, and we're not even done yet. We grab an idle sticker to replace the alluring sticker that we picked up back in the first jail. <laughs> Remember that one? Which will further boost our showtime gauge recharge rate. Nice. From there, we exploit the final assessor's weakness to nuke to keep it mostly stun locked and push on to Akira Kanoe's Medice Tower. There is, of course, a mandatory lockkeeper that we're forced to take down first, but it's weak to electricity, which we can now exploit thanks to our newfound Zionga skill from the Kyoto Treasure Demon Farm. Here's our setup going into the Akira Kanoe fight for those who are interested. Hit that Counter-Strike.mp3 because it's time to rock. Hey, wanna listen to some tunes?
phase one and his Zephyrus mech is an absolute joke. Not only is it weak to electricity, but it's incredibly slow and sluggish, with moves that are powerful but very predictable. Most of the time these railguns are slightly too high, but occasionally you can clip the top of its head hitbox if you time it right and get lucky. It's a really fun fight, but after 7 minutes the mech has fallen and it's time for phase 2. Akira is a uh, Jedi now, <laughs> but retains his electrical weakness so can mostly get stun locked. That is until, yep, he can one shot us. <laughs> Ouch! That means that in this phase we have to stay on the offensive and learn and respond to his diverse moveset because otherwise we are toast, but that's exactly what we do, and after just 5 minutes he goes down on, uh, yeah, he goes down. <laughs> after a quick pit stop in Yokohama, we push on through the Jail of the Abyss. On paper this place seems scary because there's no way to back out to access shops or anything, you're literally stuck here, but the enemies are manageable and many of them can be skipped so it's no big deal. There is a quote battle against Sophie here, but it's just a timed scripted event so it's over in just a minute or so. Speaking of Sophie, full disclaimer, there is a mandatory fight here in which you're forced to play as Sophie, but we just swap over to Joker to avoid needing to use her. It was still a bloody tough fight against Ichinose's goons here, especially due to the lack of items, and we died more than a few times. So we swap up Jack's moveset before pushing in again. Armed with self-healing options and a blessed damage skill, the 100 armed watcher goes down in just a few minutes and we're done with this godforsaken place. But before we can push on too far up the final tree of knowledge dungeon, we have something to take care of. Earlier I promised you that we'd take on this killer teddy bear dire shadow from the first jail once we'd powered up a bit, so here's the footage. The fight went on forever and we used up all of our items, but it was all worth it. For the video content, not the crappy tyke charm. <laughs> Time for the final boss of Persona 5 Strikers. Here's our setup going in. jack o -Lantern and Joker are both sitting at level 75 and we've got a nice selection of medium power damaging spells here, even though we won't be using most of them. <laughs> as well as a Regenerate 3 to keep our health topped up in the event that we run out of items and SP. This is a bit of a stab in the dark and we'll probably lose, but if we do then it's nice just to see how close we are and how much more grinding we might need to do. Ok, brace yourselves everyone, let's do it. The Demiurge is a massive opponent with tens of thousands of HP and can seem incredibly intimidating at first sight. The battle revolves around four rectangular platforms with the god in the centre. Despite its weakness to bless and curse, we really need to save our SP for the later phase, so for now it's guns and physical strikes only. Thankfully the Demiurge is quite slow in this phase and its attacks can be easily avoided, with the exception of one move that blows up an entire platform. Anyone else think this fight would be a lot more interesting if it permanently destroyed the platform though, like forcing you into an ever shrinking space? Hmm, just a thought. Back here though, phase 1 is done in just under 15 minutes. Disclaimer: After the group discovers that the second form is literally invincible, there's a section here in which you're forced to allocate all party members to one of three groups, similar to Final Fantasy VI, with the lesser two groups having to deal with the boss's big balls. In terms of player control, we just went with Sophie and Zenkichi because we've already been forced to use those two and we were careful not to summon their personas at any point. Within just a few minutes, we're back with Joker for the final phase. The Demiurge is now much more aggressive, deals more damage and is harder to avoid. We just go all out on this thing, burning through all of our SP reserves for huge amounts of blessed damage, as well as spamming soulful jelly items that we had stockpiled. Using three of these grants us a free showtime. Rinse and repeat. Once it gets down to a sliver of health, we get in close for repeated bless skill spam until it finally falls. Can you beat Persona 5 Strikers with only a Jack O' Lantern? Heck yeah! That was another really fun challenge run with some surprising difficulty spikes. 
As always, if you're not sick of the sound of my voice yet, then feel free to check out our full playlist of challenge runs. But for now, see you later everyone. Cheers. Subscribe or I will haunt your dreams. <laughs> <coughs>